the Democratic Republic of the Congo or DRC or Congo, not the Republic of the Congo. That's a completely different country. Let's be honest, today it's an awful country to live in. The average Congolese holds about 500 US dollars and over 75% live in poverty in a country of 90 million. But wait, the DRC is abundantly resource rich. They have so many minerals and so much space to become an agricultural beast. Why are they so poor? It's exploitation. The people of the Congo have been exploited ever since, well, ever. As we'll see, the Congo has had one of the most miserable histories on this planet. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know whether to name this video the miserable history, life, or economy of the Congo, but it doesn't matter because all of those are true and they're all related. How were these people exploited and why is the DRC so poor nowadays? Let's start off in the jungles of Central Africa on the rivers of the Congo. There is a pre-colonial kingdom called the Kingdom of Congo with a K. It lasted from around 1392 until 1862, almost 500 years of rule. If you think it was just the colonization of Africa that killed the Congo's chance of prosperity, you need to see this kingdom. The kings essentially made their fortunes out of taxing the ever-living souls out of their subjects. Any extra product the farmers or miners or builders or whatever made would be taxed for the king. The king upheld this by making a strong military force to fight neighboring tribes, but mainly to keep their population in check. The people of the Congo, like most others would, absolutely hated this and moved out of the larger cities where the king had the most power. This made a massive rural population too decentralized to become any larger power than it was. The farmers now were mostly working for subsistence rather than trade, but wait, me as the king cannot make an absolute golden fortune if I do not have rich subjects to extract the wealth from. Luckily, there's two solutions to this problem. The first is neighboring tribes, which the Congo had plenty of. The Luba, Lunda, Kuba, Kasai, and Kasembe people all lived here. You don't want to be taken over by them, do you? The king will protect you and save you from those barbarians, so people still had to be loyal to the king. The competition perhaps made the king slightly less exploitative than he would have liked to have been, since there is such a huge incentive to take over the kingdom and extract the wealth for yourself. The second solution to the extraction problem is via, uh, slavery. Prisoners of war and bad subjects to the king would be made slaves and sold mainly to the Arabs through the caravan trade, part of the larger Indian Ocean slave trade. If you're the king of Congo and your subjects stop bringing you wealth, they still had value to you by selling them. Ding dong, it's 1482 and that's the Portuguese at the door, and they want to trade, but if you adopt all of these new, more productive technologies, the people might become richer and get some certain ideas. There's one technology the king gladly adopted though, guns. They only adopted the technologies that would let them stay in power longer and extract more of the Congo's wealth. The king, Nzinga and Nkuwu, changed his name to Joao I and the Congo was becoming Christianized to work with the Portuguese better. In exchange, they gave the Portuguese their specialty, some slaves. That's a really healthy society, right? A massive, now much more powerful military force using its power to take all of your extra work for an already rich king and if you don't comply, you would be sold off to the Arabs or Europeans. Surprise, from losing significant amounts of their population to slavery and fighting with other tribal powers, the Kingdom of the Congo was weakened significantly and taken over by the Portuguese who didn't change much about how the nation was structured. Really, the only thing they changed was instead of the king taking everyone's wealth, it was them instead. It's the late 1800s now and the Europeans are starting to get a little cocky. They started a massive rooster measuring contest to see who could build the biggest armies, navies, and empires. But there is one continent they left mainly untouched, Africa. They started scrambling for Africa, not because of its abundant resources, but mainly out of pride. They held a conference of a couple dozen guys to split up the continent of millions of people. What did they do with this chunk in the middle though? The British, French, Portuguese, and Germans all wanted it, but they already had enough and getting it would have made one of them too powerful, so they just gave it to tiny Belgium. Oops, did I say Belgium? No, they didn't. They gave it as personal property to the Belgian king, Leopold II. If his rule had to be summed up in one picture, it would probably be this. Leopold restructured the entire Congolese system to fit his agenda of extracting as much wealth as possible out of the Congo like copper, gold, ivory, and especially rubber. 
But unlike the old kings and Portuguese who lived there and had to keep their people at least somewhat well off, Leopold had no incentive for that. His system was specifically designed to suck as many resources and labor as possible. His force public loyalists from the Congo would roam around the country killing rebels or burning their villages down to make the people terrorized into submission. Some of their atrocities are kidnapping families, killing those who didn't meet quotas, and most famously, cutting off their hands if they did not produce enough. The people under this regime suffered and even though it lasted only 23 years, it has defined the Congo ever since Leopold's rule. Eventually, other European powers said something like, I mean, we're doing that too, but holy, you took it too far, man, to Belgium and pressured the Parliament of Belgium to annex the colony from Leopold, which they did in 1908. Now it was a Belgian colony, but they continued more or less the same thing. The main difference is under Leopold, he had to pay for the Congo to function like a business, but Belgium did not want to subsidize the colony and now the Congo is responsible for financing itself. With what wealth though? Uh, that's right, not much. As a result, most infrastructure and social services were not provided by the state, but by foreign companies trying to get some minerals and by Christian missionaries. Some remnants from Leopold's days stayed, like focusing on cash crops rather than food production for foreign investors and forcing everyone to work at least 60 days on the farm a year. Most of the work was done through mining monopolies set up in different provinces of the Congo, like the SGB and UMHK. These companies were there for their own profit rather than the prosperity of the nation. At least they are the main builders of roads and rail for the nation as they needed them to ship their metals off for processing. The Belgians ran the country with the thought that Africans were children, stopping initiatives like schooling to let locals in the decision making processes. As a result, the locals who eventually gained power were obviously pretty resentful of the Belgians and Western values in general, but there was still no political reform to get them into more authority. That didn't come until World War II when after the Belgians were taken over by Germany, they realized that being conquered and subjugated was not that fun and liberalized the Congo a little bit. A middle class was formed called the Avalves who weren't rich by our standards but by 1950s Congo Lee standards were much better off than average. The Belgians also tried and failed to make the Congo more industrialized through cutting off imports they needed so that they would force a domestic industry. Yet the Congo was still a very raw material export based economy run by Belgian experts. But when will they get independent? Hold on in a bit. The rise of the Alliance de Congo, or ABACO for short, led to a much more nationalistic movement, particularly among the Evolves. ABACO called for a much more centralized state run by the Congolese and the Belgians out. After some riots led by the Evolves in the late 50s, Belgium realized that they could not hold down the Congo anymore and let them go, with ABACO taking control of the country in June 1960 and independence was given. After all of those years of hardship under a brutal king and then a brutal colonial regime, the Congo can finally start to grow, right? Not exactly. Remember that whole thing about Abaka wanting a highly centralized state? Well, the Congo was not meant for that. Its population was very rural and ethnically confused. Most regions could have acted like different countries if they wanted to. Plus, who will be the ones in charge of this new Congo? The people there have only seen how the elite use their power to get rich and maybe they want to try a taste of that. So post-independence there is massive instability and fighting for who gets to centralize this incredibly decentralized state. In addition, when the Belgians left, they brought their workers with them. Not a big deal, right? Well, it was, because the Belgians worked in the government. In fact, only 3 out of 5,000 government workers were Congolese, the rest were Belgian. And out of 20 million people in the Congo, the number who graduated from a university was... 16? No, just 16. So when the Belgians left, they basically took the government and education with them. It's a miracle how the Congo even exists today. It almost collapsed right after independence through many coups, civil violence, and rebel groups calling for their own independence. But by 1965, power was consolidated through one man and his party, Mobutu Sese Seko. Mobutu did what all the other leaders of the Congo had done, extract the wealth. While the Congolese suffered, Mobutu was renting out private planes and buying castles on his trips to Europe. Any foreign company wanting to set up operations in the Congo had to give him, personally, a little slice of their income. He did this by nationalizing mining companies and using the import substitution industrialization the Belgians used, having massive control over the economy. 
Right after he took power, he radically changed the country in another way too. He started the Zairianization of the Congo. The Congo changed its name to Zaire. In fact, everyone had to change their name to African names away from French names. Zaire was a dictatorship based off of extraction from Mobutu and his friend's personal gain. The rulers distributed their money pool to loyalists, family or the military rather than spending it on infrastructure or institutions for the people and this whole nationalization process just took the mines and plantations of the old colonial elite and gave it to Mobutu allies making a new elite. Now foreign investors were very discouraged from Zaire and took their money away which led to a loss of business and massive shortages of food. Also, in 1974, when the price of copper, a key ingredient in the Zairean economy, collapsed, so did the economy. With purchasing power in 1979, only 4% of that in 1960. It got so bad that they had to ask some old business owners who fled the country to please come back. By the 90s, GDP was still on the decline with awful infrastructure, corruption, no openness, and property rights not protected. In fact, per capita income halved between 1990 and 2000, and hyperinflation made one US dollar equal to 110 million Zairean Zaires. But this was likely due to the spillover of the Rwandan genocide into Zaire, causing rebels to get some ideas, leading to the first Congo War from 1996 to 1997. The Second Congo War started a year later, this time with the entire country involved, as a result of the broken economy and society formed under Zairean rule. It involved tons of foreign African countries funding different rebel groups and was essentially just decentralized chaos throughout the entire nation. Three million people died with millions homeless, hungry, and the little infrastructure that now DRC had was destroyed. It was the largest war ever since World War II, ending in 2003. From 2003 onwards, the DRC has been trying to recover with democracy, zoning industries, international economic missions, and improving their extractive sectors, perhaps with the aid of China. Still though, like most of their history, unrest, rebels, and extraction plague the modern Congo and it's likely not going to get any better. These rebel groups will only grow in power as the Congo will get more people. 194 million by 2050 and 362 million by 2100. So like the rest of their history, expect the future of the Congo to be dark. The Congo has always been a society plagued by extraction of its abundant resources. Its pre-colonial self was one where the king would take any extra production you made and if you didn't accept that, would literally sell you instead. Its colonial self was one where foreign powers would extract as much stuff and labor as they possibly could out of the country, not really caring about how it would affect the future of the nation. And its post-colonial self was one where rebel groups have been fighting to take control of the only power structure they knew with a new elite taking over. The Congo has always been curved by its rulers and unfortunately, there's not much you can do to undo 500 years of their miserable history.